Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks everybody for being here. I'm Patty Southard. I lead the King County Green Tools Program and I just want to welcome everybody that's here today. And I also want to welcome everybody that's on the webinar right now. We have folks from the region, but also we know there's some folks uh, checking in from out of state and as far as Washington, D.C. So, Bal, I know you're here. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, and I also really want to thank the city of Bellevue, uh, our cohorts in crime, Emma Johnson and Jennifer Ewing, who do a lot of work with us in our, on our countywide green building task force. Um, and then we have uh, another roundtable coming up in March, and that uh, roundtable is going to be in the city of Redmond on Thursday, March 15th, and we are going to be talking about transportation equity in that round table. And then we are going to be taking off uh, the months of April and May for the Go Green Conference and the Living Future Conference and the Congress for New Urbanism. So uh, stay tuned. There are going to be some trainings coming up, and we are going to be doing a training on April 10th um, about biophilic design, and we are uh, going to be graced with these amazing women that started a company called Whole Trees. And that training will be at um, the King Street Center in downtown Seattle. So we'll be getting the word out about that as well. And if anybody has any other events they'd like to announce, you can do that now. Anybody? I'm Laura. I'm with uh, GLY Construction. And we host the Seattle <coughs> Eastside Collaborative for Cascadia Green Building Council. And on February 27th, um, City of Bellevue and PSE are going to come talk about um, green building incentives. So if you're looking to uh, do green buildings or looking into doing buildings in the city of Bellevue and you want to look and see what incentives can help you get greener, come check it out. Um, see me after the event and I'll get you all the information. Thanks, Laura. And if you send me that information, we'll put it out in the newsletter too. Thank you. Um, if you're new to the roundtables, please sign in so we can keep up with you and you can keep up with what we've got going. And now I'd like to introduce Jennifer Ewing, the Environmental Stewardship Program Manager for the City of Bellevue, and uh, Jennifer is going to introduce the speakers. Thank you, Jennifer. Sure. Yep. I'm just going to introduce the speakers real quick. Um, first, I'll start with Dr. Erica Blackshire. <clears throat> She's an Associate Professor and Director of Undergraduate Studies at the Department of Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Washington. Her research, scholarship, and teaching examine ethical and policy implications of the social determinants of and social inequities in health with focus on health promotion and um, disease prevention, children's development and health, and US health system reform. Dr. Blackshire also conducts empiric research using deliberative engagement strategies with minority and min marginalized populations to inform population health policy. Prior to joining the University of Washington, she was a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health and Society Scholar at Columbia University, Research Scholar for Population Health Ethics at the Hastings Center in Garrison, New York, and Senior Program Associate at the Center for Practical Bioethics in Kansas City. <coughs> she received a PhD and MA in Bioethics at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, and undergraduate degrees in philosophy and, jur and in journalism from the University of Kansas. She is a, also a first generation high school graduate. Dr. Amy King is an associate, uh, excuse me, assistant professor at the University of Washington in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. She graduated with an architecture degree from University of Illinois and then it obtained an MS in civil engineering from Illinois Institute of Technology and a PhD in civil engineering focusing on predicting energy savings from energy service projects. Prior to obtaining her graduate degrees, she worked as an architect and project engineer in Chicago on large public infrastructures. Dr. Kim's research mainly focuses on the interactions between sustainable building design, facility operation, and the needs of the occupants in terms of comfort, well-being, and performance. Her expertise includes assessing the impact of occupant behavior on building energy modeling, building indoor environmental quality monitoring, and uh, facility operational design decision-making strategies. Currently, her work includes quantifying the impact of healthy workplace strategies that foster productivity and team collaboration for improved organizational performance. 
<coughs> and then Tom Knittel is the design principal at Seattle's architecture studio. Um, um, he is responsible for the overall design direction of projects um, in the studio and co-directing HDR Center of Regenerative Design. His work explores the intersection of people, place, and ecology and spans a variety of project types and scale, including higher education, science and technology, healthcare, civic, mixed use, and urban planning in the Americas, Asia, Middle East, and Caribbean. Tom has received 30 design awards, including the AIA Top 10 Green and GSA Design Excellence Awards. Tom is a frequent lecturer on design innovation and biomimicry, including giving the annual Sustaining Our World address at, in the 2013 at the University of Washington. He earned a master's degree from Harvard um, Graduate School of Design and is a certified biomimicry professional. A volunteer design leader for the LEAD and WELL Platinum um, William Jefferson Clinton Children's Center in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. He also serves on the advisory board of the Biomimicry Center at ASU. So please welcome our speakers and Dr. Um, Blackshear will go first. <coughs> Thanks everyone, whenever I, can you all hear me first of all? Is that thing on? Yes? Okay, and I'm realizing you guys are here so I'll try to just project really widely. Um, you know, whenever I hear introductions it makes me realize that we need to be briefer in sending our bios. We need, we need briefer bios, so sorry for that torture. <coughs> Surprised we didn't tell you about, you know, our childhoods, anyway. Um, so, as, uh, as noted in the introduction, I, I am not an architect. Um, I'm trained as an ethicist and I focus on population health ethics. And what I have been tasked with is um, speaking to the broader social context in which um, health occurs that influence uh, health and longevity outcomes. So, there's uh, good news and there's bad news. Um, and uh, Amy and Tom are the lucky ones. They get to talk about the good news. As architects, I guess they're going to, in addition to other things, uh, share uh, uh, some of the good news, some of the evidence about the connections between uh, human health and wellness and um, buildings that are designed and constructed according to green standards, such as uh, the well building standard, the LEED, and, and many others. Um, as, as I'll explain, evidence suggests that, that healthy buildings can indeed help keep people healthy and well. Um, the bad news is, is that uh, human health is uh, influenced by a far broader array of social factors and social conditions than simply the, the buildings we, we live and work in, as, as, important as, as important as they are. Um, these social conditions and factors are commonly referred to as the social determinants of health. And um, I just want to quickly take a show of hands. Is that a term that's familiar to those of you in the room, to some of you in the room? When I first started talking about the social determinants of health 15, 20 years ago, I never got any hands up in the room. People just looked at me with knitted brows. Increasingly, though, people have heard the language of social determinants of health. So I'm going to talk just quickly about what those are. Um, I have, uh oh, it's shutting down. <laughs> That's a tragedy. Uh, <laughs> did I take too long to get to no. it? Did, was I slow? <laughs> I don't think so. I apologize for that. It may take me a second. Figure out what so, I'm thinking maybe I'll just keep talking and then by the time I explain what they are, you'll have a nice graphic depicting what they are. Um, so, social determinants of health refer to the social, economic, and environmental conditions uh, in which people uh, grow up, live, learn, work, play, and age. Um, and um, if I had this really nice little circle, and I su suspect my doing this doesn't help you at all, um, there are hundreds of images of the social determinants of health, um, and I have picked one that's particularly uncomplicated. Uh, Do you want me to I flip through it? I need to start with the WebEx again. I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. That's okay. Uh, um, okay. So there are um, social conditions. So uh, I've actually got two graphics to show you. Um, social conditions that relate to uh, things such as um, uh, the kind of family or community or social support you have, the amount of um, violence or safety that is in your neighborhood, um, in, your, in your region. Um, you've also got physical environmental factors related to things like your air and water quality, your housing and your transit. Um, 
and I keep looking at the picture which isn't there. Um, things like whether or not you have access to clinical care, um, as well as economic factors related to things such as your educational level, your income level, and even you can measure those at the individual level, you can uh, uh, measure those at the family level, at the neighborhood level, because all of those things impact the resources that um, are available in your immediate area and the quality of your skills, your, your schools, as well as um, the kinds of opportunity structures that you have. So um, the point here is that better off people um, the better off people are, the better their social conditions. And I'm going to have lots of slides to show you just as soon as this comes up because um, it's taking a little bit of time to get up the graphics. But the point of this is that um, the better off you are, the better your social conditions, the more resources, safety, um, support, stability while growing up leads to more enrichment. Um, opportunities, opportunities for education during critical periods of development, leading to more rewarding and higher paying jobs, career opportunities, um, and safer uh, support and supportive peer networks and prospects for partners. And all of this um, relates and impacts health outcomes. So this relationship between social advantage and health is persistent, pervasive, and robust. And it's reflected in a pattern um, referred to as the social gradient in health. So I'm just curious, some of you have heard of the social determinants of health. How many of you have heard of the social gradient in health? So Patty's heard of the social gradient in health, and maybe she's the only person. And of course, we don't know of those who are dialed in how many have heard of the social gradient in health. So we've long known that rich people uh, live longer, healthier lives than do poor people. So let me just stop for a minute and go back. This is the graphic I was describing. Uh, as I said, there, there are many different ways to categorize the social determinants of health. This one chooses physical environments, then we have social environments, then we have lifestyle and behaviors, and economic environments. The interesting thing about lifestyle environments, I'll just note, is that um, some people don't even count those as social determinants, but if you think that our behaviors, uh, what we do and don't do in the realm of diet and exercise and our sexual activity and our, and our drug and alcohol use is strongly influenced by, constrained by our social environments, then you think of them as social determinants of health. Here's the other graphic I wanted to show you. Here's another way of sort of slicing the pie in terms of the social determinants of health. And this data is actually interesting. This logic model is interesting because it, um, it actually was done by a crack team at the University of Wisconsin that um, through, please don't ask me to explain how they came to these uh, uh, relative contributions, but through some very complex um, uh, mathematics, um, they have estimated that health behaviors contribute some 30% to health outcomes, clinical care some 20%, social and economic factors some 40%, and the physical environment some 10%. Bio you'll notice that genes and biology are not reflected there because there they're just working with the social determinants of health. And if you have questions about genes and biology, we can talk about that in the Q&A. But this is the social gradient in health, and I have a couple of graphics I want to show you quickly, and I want to be mindful of the time, but um, what the social gradient in, in health is is a stepwise inverse relationship between social position and health outcomes. And um, this pattern holds wherever people, wherever researchers study population health. It doesn't matter whether you use education as a gauge of advantage um, or whether you use income as a gauge of advantage you still get this stepwise gradient. We even see this um, tragically in, in early life. Um, and so I, we can, I can go back to these in the Q&A to kind of unpack what you're seeing there. But what you're seeing is that the more education you have, the healthier, your, uh, the, the healthier you will be and the, the longer you will live. The more income you have, the same situation. And then this graphic is a bit more complicated, but it captures both income and race ethnicity. And what you see there is that um, whites are represented in the burgundy, ye the yellow represent Hispanic, and black the orange. And people on this side have are 400 um, uh, uh, percent above family poverty level, and those at the end are at poverty level or lower, and they have the worst health. And you can see within these income groups, there's variation by race and ethnicity. Very interesting um, data. We can circle back to it um, if you'd like to sort of unpack what you're seeing there. The point of this is just to show the power of social position as, as measured by various gauges of advantage and disadvantage. 
um, on your health and longevity. So let me not show you that graphic uh, there just yet. So there's some um, bad news there, and I want to just share a bit, uh, one more piece of uh, uh, bad news, and that is that um, we don't do well as a nation uh, when we compare ourselves to other countries. Now, these are OECD countries, Organization of Economic, um, uh, Economic and Cooperative Development countries. Uh, if we compared ourselves even with a smaller set of countries, what are called peer countries, so about 16 countries that are all very wealthy and very developed, we still compare poorly. We are the red, uh, the red <coughs> bar here. And this, the here they're measuring life expectancy. But if you were measuring a whole array of um, health outcomes, you would see something very similar. So I'm going to go back to this real quickly. This, this, these, um, these outcomes hold for all 14 major causes of disease. So a big group of diseases, a big group of causes of death, and most forms of mental disorder and disease. And the gradient reaches into the upper, uh, la up an, into the upper ladder of, of socioeconomics. And tragically, it's foreshadowed in children's health and development. So just a few more details about that pattern. So, okay, I told you I was the bad news, and that is the bad news. And let me just say a little bit about why this matters, and then I'll, I'll hand it off to, to Amy and Tom. So why, why should we care about poor health? Um, and why should we care about enabling people to have good health? Well, good health is essential to human wellness and, and, um, and w well-being, and um, for full participation in society. And poor health <laughs> um, can mean devastation, uh, fear, isolation, disability, and premature death. And poor health not only takes a toll on the individuals um, who are affected by it, but additionally on their families, on their communities, and the nation as a toll. I'm just going to share one tiny fact with you about uh, the toll that is taken um, on our country by our poor health outcomes as depicted by this graphic which is that we, um, we spend more than any other nation on the globe on health care. Mm -hmm. If things continue unabated by 2019, we'll spend some 19% of our G GDP on medical services, on medical services, which prevents us from investing in other social sectors that w could actually contribute to creating the social conditions um, um, that would help everyone be healthy. So instead, what we're doing, if you can imagine an ambulance at the bottom of a cliff, we're just building, sending more and more ambulances at the bottom of the cliff. So I'm like Debbie Downer on Saturday Night Live, but I have a slight <laughs> uplifting message at the end, which is to say that uh, social, these social conditions, these social determinants, are man-made. We created them. We can change them. They're a function of collective decisions that we make over time, and that's the good news. Um, and talking with people like you all in this room and who are dialed in, planners, architects, builders, people in positions of power and government, um, it's paramount that you all think about not only healthy buildings, but I would suggest the broader social conditions in which people um, can either be helped to be healthy or made sick. So I'll stop there and I'll hand this off to Amy. All right. So I want to thank Erica for giving us this broad perspective. I don't have to do that job, so it makes it so much easier. Um, I'll dive into a little bit of the, the healthy building trends um, and talk about, you know, why are we interested in healthy buildings? We understand that healthy and well-being of occupants is really important, of people is really important. So what about buildings? The different rating system that's available right now for certifying your building as a healthy building can we extend the value of those healthy building rating system through advanced measurement and performance and then give you some actual project examples. There are, there are local projects, one at the University of Washington and then one actually in this building. And so Emma is here so, and also I would like to say that my postdoc that worked on many of these research projects is here so if you have any questions we'd be happy to address them. Okay, so uh, this is a more of a conceptual or a theoretical <coughs> framework or model that I also like to use a lot in my own research. But basically, um, it was developed by um, Newsham and, and his group of researchers up in Canada. They were looking at the linkage between the effect of indoor environmental quality 
on um, job satisfaction. And so when they looked at this, they found out that the physical conditions uh, impact our overall environmental satisfaction. And that even accounting for other things that affect job satisfaction has a huge impact on how we feel um, satisfied in, in workplaces. And also that leads to um, organizational productivity. If you look at the different rating system that's available right now, I think many of us are already very familiar with the LEED rating system um, and also probably the Living Building Challenge um, systems, especially those in the Pacific Northwest. And so um, what I'd like to focus today is really on the WELL and the Fit Well rating system, which is targeted specifically for um, looking at the health impact of occupants. Um, now, WELL was established after spending about six years um, in looking at the uh, empirical evidence and the research from science and also the medical field, came up with these seven different concepts. I think they have eight now. The eighth one is called innovation, but starting with air and water, nourishment, light, fitness, within these concepts, they have different specific uh, metrics that you can use to look at the performance of your building. Um, it was developed by the International Well Building Standard, and I know Tom is going to be able to show you an actual project and maybe dig deeper into the actual um, performance metrics um, that are involved in using the system. But um, it's been, I think, about in three years already that it's been in existence, and they have over 700 buildings that are certified, very similar to the LEED rating system. And they also have a global presence. So they've got projects not just in the US, but all over the world. Um, very similar to that project is, uh, or as rating system, is the FitWell system, which was jointly developed by um, US Center for Disease Control and also GSA, General Services Ad Administration. Um, GSA, having a huge portfolio of buildings that they could use, was able to develop the FitWell system, again, again looking at these various health impact categories, meaning that all of their strategies have to somehow positively impact these health um, impact categories. And I can give you an example, like uh, maybe improving the occupant's safety or increasing the physical ac activities. Um, came up with strategies that th they could use as well. Now, GSA was able to pilot their fit well um, rating system, and with that, getting feedback from their facility managers and also the occupants, they were able to refine um, that rating system. So these are some rating systems that are available. I believe they have about 400 buildings that are certified, and they have more um, owners that have committed to certifying their buildings fit well. Um, we are going through, City of Bellevue is also going through a FitWell certification for this particular building too. So we'll talk about that very briefly at the end. But um, they're in concept, they're kind of doing, doing the same thing, right? How do you provide an environment that's actually better and also productive for your employees? The question that I usually get after I present this, it's, it's a great philosophy. We understand that you know, we, we need to provide a better environment for our people is, how much will it cost me if I want to do a well building or a fit well building? And so we looked at, uh, it, this is for a hypothetical case for a, for a 300,000 square foot building. This would be a new construction. I mean, there are some costs that's um, built into this that we all, I think, know and that's a basic cost, which would be the registration and the certification cost. Fit well has a flat fee for your, um, for your single building. Um, for the well building, um, that varies and it depends on the square foot of your building. So you would have to, for a 30,000 square foot building, what we came up with was for the fit well, it would be 6,500 for your certification, 500 for your registration, so $7,000 in total. For your uh, well building, uh, it'd be about $150,000 which would include your $6,500 for your registration fee. Um, the design fee, again, this would vary. Um, in the case where we wanted to calculate this, I did get to talk to one of the 
Fitwell ambassador that's um, practicing in the Midwest and they've done a couple buildings already. And so I, I figured that in to figure out the design cost, but it would, that would vary. For the well, there is a ongoing maintenance uh, and uh, a recertification fee that's involved. Once you get certified, you do have to recertify every three years to show that you're meeting that performance uh, requirement. Um, for the fit well, um, you assume that based on the empirical research that they use to create this rating system, they do not require that you report this or measure this or keep a record of, of your actual um, uh, performance measurements. Um, so the total project, as you can see, it, it's, it's quite different, and I'm sure Will is working through this to see how to make this more cost effective, but the advantage of Well would be that you are showing performance through these recertification. The advantage for the fit well would be that, you know, it's <coughs> very cost effective, and you can still use it to show that you are doing the things that are necessary for your building to show that you really do care about your um, people in the building. So we being researchers, we took this apart and we looked at the different performance metrics that are actually involved in kind of both of these standards. And we were able to cluster them into these four big categories. Um, the first one was air quality. The second one, water quality. There's a few parameters in your light and also um, comfort. Um, also light is in the comfort. You know, comfort included other things like acoustics, which would be in comfort as well. Again, the, the red cells um, with the number one shows that well will require you to get at least a single um, one-time performance measurement of these various parameters. Um, fit well, assuming that you know, it's already the strategies are based on empirical evidence, assume that if you do those strategies, you could meet these uh, minimum thresholds. But because of the cost that's involved in looking at uh, the performance of these buildings. What we did, and we did this really for our internal need. University of Washington was looking at ways to make uh, better buildings. You know, how do we go beyond uh, lead or green and how do we make healthy buildings? And so we did a little uh, exercise where we looked at, well, is there a way to kind of level this uh, performance metric uh, so if, if, you're, if you're constrained by different types of resources, and these resources are things like, you know, there's obviously some equipment cost um, that's involved if you want to get uh, performance uh, uh, measurements on these parameters, and then also testing cost. You've got to have the right people that could actually collect the data, but also analyze that data. So we scaled it into three different um, categories or approaches is what I would call. One was kind of the cost effective method, uh, which would not include every single parameter that's required by, uh, well, at this point. But what you can do in, in some of the parameters, other parameters, you can do multiple spot measurements to kind of show a trend within your entire building to get an average instead of getting a single point. Um, the balance approach is where you have these uh, one-time measurements, but you also implement it with these other yellow cells shown in number two is to get multiple spot measurements. And the most comprehensive measurement, of course, would include things like not just one time and multiple measurements, but also getting continuous data over a period of time so you can read the different trends. So some project examples that we um, do in our particular lab, and I don't think I need to talk about this long because we are looking at kind of the balance between not just um, benefiting the environment, but how can we do something really good for the people? Um, and we're talking about healthy building in this case, but also, does it make sense economically? What's the return on investment for all of this? So we did a uh, lighting project in particular to look at what is the impact on lighting on, on employees or people and organization. And so the building we looked at was UW Tower. This is, uh, we call it a high rise building on our campus. Um, it's a 22 story building. We have about 2000 employees um, that are working in this building, uh, representing over 65 different departments. It's about a half a million square foot. And it's in the heart of the Seattle's U district. We wanted to see a few things. We wanted to see, you know, what is the impact of lighting change on, you know, 
obviously the energy reduction, but also what is it on people? You know, are people more satisfied within their environment and will that really impact the organization's performance at the same time? So we did a number of spot measurements as well as continuous measurement of different lighting parameters. Also did a occupant survey before and after the retrofit. So we have post occupancy um, evaluation on that as well. And what we found out was that people really um, enjoyed having autonomy over their space. I mean, the LED lighting really helped. Um, and then we also added these color tunable light fixtures that allow different color rendering as well as different intensity for their immediate space. And so by doing that, you know, it really improved um, uh, the people's satisfaction. But also at this point, what we're looking at is by us having uh, being able to lower the, uh, the overhead lighting uh, fixture energy consumption, but we've added now extra plug loads because we've given them the light lamps. You know, what is that? What does that come out to? So we're doing a study on that actively right now. And like I said, Stanley right there has been actively looking at the data. So if you're curious, please, you know, please talk to us after this presentation or during the presentation. Okay, so this looks should look all familiar. You've all walked through this space just now, but um, City of Bellevue, obviously it's, it's an existing building. It's been renovated. And some of the studies that we did here, um, we've actually done more than what I'm presenting today. So I'm sure if you have questions, Emma would be happy to answer that. We've looked at occupant-driven occupant loads in this building. So we looked at a lot of the plug load in this building, um, as well as what I'll be talking about today is really the indoor air quality study, as well as what was the FitWell certification process like. But um, we've got a mixed workforce in this building. Um, there's all over 800 employees as well. Um, close to 4,000 square feet of space in, uh, in this building. And we're close to a major highway here. And the reason we mentioned that is because we've been looking at that very closely as we were doing the indoor air quality study. So there, they, there's been some complaints in this building, um, uh, very sensitive occupants to uh, dust, pollen, and different kind of smell. And so I know Emma and her, her team has been doing some studies on looking at um, spot measurements of indoor air quality. And we came in in 2017 to do also, we did a number of spot measurements, I believe over 60 different spots um, throughout this building. So all the way from the basement, all the way to the top floor of this building, um, but also some continuous measurement in spots where people have been um, giving us some complaints about various smells or dust and things like that. So using all of that, plus um, some interview data from those people, we were able to see um, not only through that, but also through different types of research that even in those well-managed urban buildings, you know, this is, this is a common um, a complaint that you might get in a building, even when it's very well-managed. And so, you know, what we suggested after measuring the different pollution, indoor pollution level, as well as the uh, VOC levels and looking at the CO2 level in this building is, you know, given that this is an open office environment, we, we found that, yes, it's hard to give them, you know, individual air purification system, but studies have shown that different cleaning techniques have helped, and so we've um, advised doing that. Also having some continuous monitoring just to look at how that's all changing to see the before and after. Some of the ongoing work that we're doing right now, we're also working with an environmental psychologist to kind of consider you know, it may change the subjective environment, but what about people? Do people perceive that? Are people happier? And does that lead that to, you know, better performance at work as well? So those are some things that we've been looking at. Uh, back to the FitWell certification. So we did that end of last year and we've submitted all our documents at this point. And, um, some things we've learned, and I, I'm sure Emma could even speak better to that, some things that are hard to change, you know, some things that were surprised, you know. But, you know, the external factors, um, we were lucky because we're right by a transit center here. <laughs> and you're building one right here too. So, you know, we're in a location where we've got that public transit system. Um, but the other thing that we were looking very closely and trying to target is where is our walking trail? Um, to, to kind of promote um, um, occupant health by going outside and really spending that time outside. 
but also um, working on our st stairwells, you know, encouraging people to use that stairwell. And that's a new sign that we just created for that, to encourage people to do that. Um, and also working on the fitness center. I know there is one here, but it's, it's, it's kind of limited in some ways. And there is some other requirements. You know, you need trainers that can teach you how to use particular equipment and things like that. So those are things that we discuss as areas of improvement. And then also um, looking at uh, the harder thing for us was to work with the vendors that are here already providing the different kind of food options. I mean, you have an existing contract right now, so how do we put in language to really encourage um, people that come here to serve food? You know, how do we encourage that? But also, how do you change the behavior of people? If you have employees that love getting ice cream from, from your vending machine, how do you change that, right? Can you get a salad instead, right? How do you, how do, you do that? And then um, the other thing, oh, the standing desk was another thing. And this is something that I felt even in my workplaces that I bought my own standing desk for my office and then found out later from HR that I could have requested it and just gotten it, right? I, I, I don't think anybody knows this. So um, the UW Tower right now doing a, doing a full interior innovation, you know, standing desk is not even an option. It's already being put in. I think that's a great strategy. So, you know, maybe kind of thinking about those as well. Um, and so the concluding remarks for this one, I, you know, the rating systems are really great. They provide a guideline. They, they're very systematic. It helps us um, <coughs> um, put these, these kind of different concepts and philosophy into practice. But, you know, it really does improve your internal business processes as well. And that's what the research is really trying to prove, right, the evidence on that. Um, we realize that you do need to engage actively with your facility managers and your building occupants. It's not something that the owner sees as valuable and just walk away or expect that your occupants would, would do this. You need to have a very close relationship. And then, you know, just like today, we're from all these different disciplines. I feel like this whole area, it's, we just have to work together and we don't get to do that a lot. You know, we have all these different, when we think well-being, right? We, we kind of have an idea of what that is, but it's almost, is it physical well-being? Is it emotional well-being? Is it social well-being? Is it economic well-being? So I think there's a huge opportunity and it's very exciting to see that um, happen right now very actively. And I think just today, I, I'm very thankful and happy that I could talk a little bit about this as well. So um, I'd like to thank Emma also, and then also um, Stanley who's here today, and then James. Um, awesome researchers that really help do all of this um, projects and to kind of figure out, you know, what is the impact of all this on our people? Thank you. Oh, yes. Yes, <laughs> did we forget that we have the microphone? We kind of pass it on to Tom. Thanks, uh, Amy. I'm, I'm really glad you got into detail so I don't have to. Um, <laughs> and, um, the reality of it is, is um, I, you know, I think that these two perspectives, one really big, uh, the big picture from Erica and then going into um, the detail with Amy, is, um, is where uh, the designer um, uh, sees the greatest opportunity to um, integrate th this in into uh, buildings that hopefully will be embraced um, by the community, by clients. Um, you know, the green building movement that's been, you know, 20 years now actively moving forward and creating some great uh, improvements in the industry. Um, then the wellness movement being, you know, about three years old. Um, the reality of it is a lot of the concepts that are, that are at play here have been happening for a while. And as they develop agency and people start to understand that uh, how important they are, and especially through research, um, that's, uh, that's really validating some of our, uh, our instincts um, about what the environment should look like, um, then, um, you know, it makes having these conversations with our clients so much more um, useful. Um, having the converse, having a, a conversation with your client about design that is also providing benefits to them in the health er uh, domain, um, it makes uh, the designer's job a lot easier. And, and so we're really excited about that at HDR. And Duncan Griffin, our managing partner, is, uh, is here today. Um, he's, uh, he's very much into this space as, as well. And um, uh, you know, what we hope is, is that uh, leading 
um, uh, uh, then uh, in this way we'll, we'll maybe go back full circle back to some of the issues that Erica uh, brought to us, which is how do we shine a light on these issues? Um, and we really believe that the idea of, um, oh, we're shutting down again. Yeah. Well, isn't that great? <laughs> um, that, uh, you know, we, this issue of, uh, of equity um, it has to has to be has to go beyond our buildings, and that what is good for people um, is good for the planet, and what is good for the planet is good for people, and um, so as we're um, fortunate enough to be in a position to um, look at the our buildings, um, and, and you know the premise for this talk was we spend 90 percent of our time in buildings, so therefore we need to really take that seriously. We, um, these buildings create a huge amount of externalities in the world. And, um, and that that is just as important. It's sort of like, how can we separate one from the other? We, we really can. Um, so uh, I'm going to, you know, when the slides come back up, you know, give a designer's perspective, um, light on a lot of details as, as one does, um, and then uh, give an example of uh, the William Jefferson Clinton Children's Center which um, you know, was a, a great initiative by the U.S. Green Building Council uh, to create not only a lead platinum, now triple net zero, and, and well uh, building in Haiti for children uh, really at risk. And um, you know, I, I think the, the focus on fitness, um, or on the um, fit well and wellness, um, uh, well building standards, the way I kind of think about it as a generalization is, is that Fit well is, is a little more structural. Um, it, it, there's a little more of sort of passive measures that, that, are, uh, that once they're baked in, you don't need the ongoing um, measurement. But well, uh, the well program has uh, both passive and active measures. So the active measures require that you know, constant engagement and, and, and testing. So um, they, they both have their place. Um, and we you know, we're, we're looking at it in our new offices that we're getting ready to move into uh, about 19,000 square feet, and we're running into the same business uh, challenge uh, from a monetary standpoint. Fit well looks so easy. We're definitely doing that, and um, so um, it's nice to be in your uh, in your client's shoes uh, okay. as well. So, looks like we're back up and running. Almost. I got to make sure I shared it with the people on the webex here. Okay, great. Can I jump on a question? Absolutely. Right, right. How do you maintain that? Yeah, well right. Well, I, I, you know, I think that um, the I, I, I really do believe that we should be monitoring uh, the quality of air, uh, our air quality environment, on, on an ongoing basis, um, because things do change. Um, the reality of it is, is that buildings are are not fixed. What changes not only in the building, um, it, uh, what happens around the building changes over time. Um, you know, we're, we're right next to the I-5, um, you know, uh, uh, the convention center, and, and we know localized air quality there is not, as, it's not so great. Um, and um, so I, I, I think it's important, yes. I, I, I would never suggest that we shouldn't do that. The reality of it is, is um, will we get to a point where this is, becomes easier and mainstreamed? Um, that's what I hope. And, you know, Duncan carries around a CO2 sensor in his, in his backpack. You know, so he, he brings it out in every meeting, and uh, when it gets too, when it gets to be too, you know, too much CO two, he said, "Okay, guys, time for a walk, right?" And I'm hoping, I'm waiting for the watch version um, of that, and uh, I think we'll get there. Um, but um, you know, I think that these are the sorts of things that we have to, we have to be concerned about. Thank yeah, you. sure. Um, So I, um, I kind of gave a bit of an intro into um, now we're not advancing, but we can just if we bring this over here.
we, when we arrived today, we plugged in everything and it worked first time. And we said, this is the first time everything has worked ever. <laughs> and of course, we never should have said that. There it goes. Let me get the steps. Oh, it's going here. <laughs> This, folks. Yes. Oh my word, my computer. Um, and you should know Tom's pictures are, are much better than mine. <laughs> They're very pretty. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. It's a good time. It'll be very sad if we can't get these yeah. booted up. Well, one um, other fact that maybe is great for this context is what's the value of your employees versus costs or some of the other offered stock costs? I mean, I think it's like employees are 10 times more valuable than yeah. your infrastructure. Is that about right? So uh, there's a breakdown, and I think Wall does a really great job of showing that. The, the cost for an organization, if you look at the cost that the organization spends, your facility and your energy is very small. Over 90%, I believe, is all on your, your asset is in your people. So it makes from the business perspective, it makes all the sense to make sure that you provide an environment that's good, not just healthy, right? Not just and the right thing to do, but also economically now it makes sense. So um, proving that is a little bit more difficult. I, I, and the good news is there's, there is a lot of information that's, that's now coming forward on that front, whether in a clinical setting, um, the, the amount of errors and emissions that go down, uh, the amount of the burnout rates for, for um, uh, emergency room doctors and nurses, um, when you provide them, you know, break rooms with, uh, w with daylight and views, um, it creates, uh, you know, when people are involved with especially critical uh, care, um, highly repetitive, um, you know, t uh, tasks, um, you know, it, it, we have to take just as seriously that we need to uh, provide sort of the offset for that. And um, so there, there is some, uh, some good research that's going across, you know, beyond, um, beyond uh, the office, which is right. where there's a lot right now, right. Uh, healthcare. Healthcare, I think. I'm and then the whole wellness industry is really, um, uh, really uh, quite, quite active in this area now. They're, they're the wellness real estate industry is, um, is now sort of uh, moved into this space. And I think w developers are getting to under beginning to understand, and the first example I was gonna show uh, that was 15 years old, um, was it wasn't really hard to convince um, a, a public utility to put in active stairways in, in, in their building. And it wasn't that hard to convince the developer that rather than having square footage sitting empty on the inside of a building in the form of two fire stairs, that putting them uh, on the outside of the building where people use them every day, um, all of a sudden it turned uh, what was just a life safety measure into a, uh, an amenity. And, um, and, uh, and I think a lot of people are you know, pretty much saying, well, why wouldn't we do that? Um, it does take a little, it costs a little bit more, but when we see the returns. Yeah. And uh, so, so that's, that's the good news. Almost there. I'm so sorry about this, folks. And I would think that if you started to calculate what employers spend on health care, given, mm -hmm. you know, that is from people not um, having a connection to nature, not taking a break and walking, not having access to a salad versus ice cream, um, you know, if you, if you really began to capture all the costs, I gotta believe the bottom line in terms of economics would begin to, to make a lot of sense. I mean, the, the, I ended on the, with the big downer nose with how much our nation spends on healthcare and how little we get in terms of health because we don't invest in social conditions that actually create health. <coughs> Instead, we just, <laughs> we just wait till people are sick and yeah. pour tons of resources in there. There's a question back yes. there. Yes.
Yes, and um, you know the, the the work that NASA did um, uh, 30 years ago, you know, that really um, helped to provide uh, metrics on uh, cleaning air, um, the the capabilities of certain plants. Now, some plants, uh, you know, are better than others, um, and some should be avoided. But there is a body of research out there about um, incorporating plants not only for biophilic purposes, but also uh, you know, from a performance standpoint, um, in terms of air quality and uh, removing uh, toxins from the air. So, so do we also have faculty in the, envir the environmental engineering um, side that study that particular question on the impact of different plants on air quality. So I think it's pretty easy for us to look at these things. Yeah. 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 Well, it, you know, I started to mention this project. I designed this 15 years ago when I was with BNIM. It's for <laughs> Board of Public Utilities in Kansas City. And, and, and uh, you know, the story behind how easy it was to, to convince them to put the stairs on the outside, um, to connect uh, actually two stairs across the common corridor, and uh, flank those with break areas and, um, and lunch rooms so that the activity hubs were sort of uh, co-mingling with the, the, ac the active stairways. And um, and the um, the the fact that there was active living research out at that time, uh, active living by design, uh, was an initiative by the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation. Um, and you know, there's ongoing research in this area. So here, 15 years ago, there was something. There wasn't a um, a well building standard yet, or fit well. But the, the research is out there, and I think we shouldn't wait for the rating systems. Mm -hmm. We should be using new information all the time, and then we should be using the rating systems to reinforce um, uh, where hopefully we're heading um, in the future. Um, you know, there some of the more recent research is around children and learning, and those are uh, interesting sort of brain scans of uh, a child at, um, and in sort of in a, a rest mode, and then after I think it's um, uh, 10 minutes or 20 minutes of walking. And you can see the brain activity is just so much more heightened. And you know, if it's good for children, it's probably good for us as well, right? And so um, one of the things about Fitwill is circuits, you know, for getting up and walking, you know, quarter, quarter mile uh, loops within your building. And um, you know you can find those in existing buildings, but wouldn't it be better to work those into the design so that they're structural and built in, um, so that they really feel like part of the the experience of uh, of, uh, of living and working there? Um, I mentioned that the uh, the research is coming in on reduction of errors and uh, critical um, uh, care uh, facilities. Um, the famous, um, what, back in 1983, your ORIC report on, um, on the recovery rates of, um, of um, in rooms, and hospital rooms that had views to the exterior to nature as opposed to views to a blank sort of brick wall uh, were significant uh, in terms of the differences in recovery rate times. Um, and then a recent report by uh, Harvard um, that uh, through controlled studies, actually, that's the image on the lower right is the room below the rooms above where they had two groups of, of um, people working in a blind uh, study. Uh, they pumped one with uh, VOCs um, th and then gave them uh, sort of um, th then uh, testing at the end of the day. Um, and, um, and then another one was, another control group was um, given air at the exchange rates and, and that you would you consider for a very green building and an extremely green building. And so the numbers um, over this controlled study were pretty, um, pretty amazing that, um, you know, 100% better in terms of crisis uh, response um, strategy and, and critical thinking uh, around strategy was even higher and <coughs> the ability to process information so that you know that, um, that that new car smell that you that you get. Um, let's hope that your uh, your <laughs> you roll the windows down because it really does affect your ability to respond. And uh, there's you know there's a new new building smell as well, right? I mean it's a common term, and 
And that's usually VOCs or other things that's not so great for you. Um, so that, that's the things that we're working on, right? Um, as we were talking about biophilia, there's a great body of research that's coming through that really is, um, uh, you know, based on this idea of um, that uh, we've had in, uh, you know, the create, recreating an environment of uh, evolu evolutionary adaption. So, you know, w we have evolved in a certain way, and um, does it support that or does it not support that? And um, it's, it's, it's really interesting space for us because it creates the opportunity for us to find ways to have this dialogue with clients. Um, there's um, more research on aesthetics of a scenic environment because frequently, or at times, we're, we're faced with, um, in, in this case, this is our uh, new um, uh, hospital in, in Chicago, where in certain you know, uh, clinical areas, you know, you're, face it, you, you're not going to get a view to the outside, but what can you do to sort of create that sort of similar scenic environment? Um, and this is new territory, right? But what can we do um, to, to take some of the principles that we begin to understand from interactions uh, with the natural world and reapply them um, in other ways? Uh, surfaces matter. Um, you know, I uh, did a competition a few years ago for a city and uh, district of, for 50,000 in China, and we really wrapped our minds around um, what the uh, ecosystem services dimension uh, of that city could look like so that um, uh, we could have uh, a truly green city. And then at the other extreme on the left is an image of a, uh, of a multi species biofilm on steel. Um, where we know that we are also having in our buildings these um, uh, microbiomes, right? Well, the things that are developing and growing and thriving in our buildings are unique uh, ecosystems unto themselves, and, and, and a lot of them are not healthy. And um, so part of where we're headed with is that we, we, we do believe that the natural environment is, has already achieved a sort of sense of balance in terms of um, generally healthy, healthy uh, outcomes. And what we, in, I suppose, uh, we, we don't intentionally create inside buildings are not intentional and many times not healthy. And uh, so sometimes defaulting to nature and what works is not a bad idea. It's a pretty good idea. And so, um, w you know, we use that as sort of a baseline. Like, for instance, urban trees, like I uh, mentioned at the beginning, we think about buildings, we also have to think about what's outside of buildings because they are uh, interconnected. Um, so a lot of great new research on urban trees, health and wellness that um, really when you look at the multiple benefits of energy reduction, carbon sequestration, um, the pollution removal that they do, not only you know, inside of buildings but outside of buildings significantly, um, the scenic environment and biophilic aspects um, for instance, this is a new report out of UBC that was just published um, that, um, that looked at the, created these pretty sophisticated computation fluid dynamic models um, demonstrating the effect that trees have just on the microclimate and their energy consumption uh, on individual buildings in a residential setting. And they calculated if you removed all those trees, there'd be a 10 or 15 percent difference in just energy costs not accounting for all those other things that we were talking about. So um, going to uh, Haiti now, I know we're running, we're running <laughs> long here. I have a four and a half minute video I'd like to show, but um, uh, I'll introduce it with, um, you know, when uh, I, I got involved with this uh, after the earthquake, I was with HOK, um, we agreed to do this project pro bono, and um, the USGBC decided to help. Um, because one orphanage um, had lost one of their buildings. And with that kind of extent of uh, death and homelessness, there were a lot of orphans um, in Haiti. And, um, you know, searching for a design uh, in, um, in something like that, I mean, is there even room for design? Are you just meet, meeting a, a basic, um, looks like we're boot rebooted again. Are we just- Do you have your flashlight? I do. If um, put it on different tables. Okay. If uh, if, if in fact um, conditions are so uh, dire like they were, um, is there even room for design? Are you are you just trying to maximize 
utility and meeting basic human needs, or is there room to do more than that? And what was great about the U.S. Green Building Council, um, it was they said, no, we're going to, we're committed to do something um, uh, great. You know, we're going to do a LEED Platinum project. Um, we're, uh, we're committed to, the de to uh, designing something that will be beautiful and inspiring. And, um, you know, it's taken six years, but it's almost finished. Um, and uh, along the way came, you know, uh, the Well Building Standard. They, um, they agreed to volunteer to do the work um, for that um, and donate their own staff to do the uh, certification work. Um, and there was a cast of, uh, you know, a, a great partners all over from Kohler donated all the plumbing fixtures and Solar City, the photovoltaics and um, the, I'm just going to keep talking until this thing comes back up, but the Global uh, uh, Water Center out of Milwaukee um, uh, designed the water purification system. Um, and so it was really a great, uh, um, an amazing thing to see so many people coming together to, to to make this happen, and um, the um, you know that circling back to that image that we had on the wall was um, coming back to you know it's a sort of a tree theme here, but there's this this theme of the larger environment and how not only buildings have to solve their indoor air quality problems, we have to also think largely about the ecosystem that it that it's within. And that image that was on the wall had uh, was an aerial view of um, of the Dominican Republic on one side and Haiti on the other. So Haiti is almost completely deforested, um, and um, in, in many, um, uh, not unlike many parts in the developing world, where uh, you know wood is used to cook, you know, inside um, uh, for f for fuel. It's used to create charcoal. Uh, there's a lot of negative health impacts with that globally. Out of the seven million people that die every year um, from air pollution, about four million are from those indoor environments where they're cooking. Um, and so we, you know, we um, we felt as if um, uh, through looking at um, the conditions in Haiti, that um, that trees and uh, wanted to be part of the story somehow. Because the, the early buildings that were in Haiti called gingerbread houses uh, all survived the earthquake. Um, but most of what they build with um, uh, that failed and created the great loss of life was in unreinforced masonry construction. So concrete block frequently made on site, um, not uh, built uh, with a seismic um, sort of um, uh, resiliency. And so as we were, um, as we were thinking about uh, the challenge, we asked ourselves, um, you know, how could we bring wood back in, in a limited way, but how could we help them build in concrete um, like, they, like they build? Uh, what kind of wood species are they? Um, the wood species, um, the native wood species? Yeah, what were the houses built from them? You know, um, you know I, I would imagine that, um, that if we went just right across the border into the Dominican Republic, you know, there was a pretty, there's still a pretty rich forest, uh, diverse mix of hardwoods and softwoods. In the higher elevations, the softwoods, and the lower elevations, the, you know, the denser, um, you know, mahoganies and, and, and woods that are really fantastic, right, uh, for using for building. And um, so, that, you know, that was probably the, you know, we could just go across the board to get that reference habitat. We, um, uh, we ended up, um, um, or Al Skidowski and, and the, the people who worked really hard at this at the USGBC ended up going to Precious Woods um, to get wood donated for the project or given that cost. And uh, that wood is actually coming from Honduras and, and Brazil. Um, and uh, not a lot of wood, but um, they, the wood that we are using is really great. It'll, it'll last a long time. And it's all from FSC certified sources. And uh, <laughs> if we didn't want to uh, contribute uh, to the problem, to a, you know, a problem that's really bad in, in that part of the world. It's interesting because when I went down to New Orleans with the International Preservation Trade Council, we found that a lot of the buildings that could have survived Katrina, there were a lot of homes in the ninth ward that survived. There were the homes that were built for 
from Cyprus. Uh, yeah. So I know that with this emerging technology around CLT, you know, there's a dialogue to be, to be had around all of that. Right, right. Uh, it is not CLT, and, and uh, you know, of course, um, at uh, the time six years ago, um, there was really wasn't much awareness of CLT uh, here uh, domestically. It was in Europe. Um, you know, we really didn't want to bring in a building on a you know, on a shipping container, um, and 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 walk away and say, okay, we've done this great thing for you, but uh, you know, good luck with any, anything else you did. We really wanted to um, to create a replicable. Uh, sort of um, uh, building um, and to uh, to begin uh, dialogue about um, uh, returning wood um, again to uh, to their local industry. Cross laminated oh, mm -hmm. yeah. and there's a lot of this. We will be doing a roundtable, if not a four-hour training, on all the issues involved in that kind of construction later this year because, you know, in this region, there's a couple CLT um, mills opening up, one in Spokane by Katerra, and then there's another one in Oregon, and um, there's a lot of controversy around what the resources are going to look like and how the wood will be resourced for the cross-laminated timbers. Um, the, the opening slide I had was a 70,000 square foot building for the University of Montana, the School of Forestry and Conservation that I'm working on. And um, the story there in Montana and actually in many places in the Pacific Northwest is that um, the federal lands in the 60s and 70s, sort of they had a change in policy in terms of the way they managed their forests and what the end result of that un uh, was unintended is now there's a whole bunch of really sort of closely spaced small diameter trees mm -hmm. that don't have much economic value. Uh, but they do for CLT. And so it takes money to, to manage those forests now, and now we have a place to use it. So mm -hmm. it's pretty exciting to see um, how, uh, what I'm calling sort of cities as forests and forests as cities, that they can, they can really work together. Um, and uh, there's, of course, they can use beetle kill uh, wood as well in CLT. Um, which is unfortunately with global warming, we're getting more of that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, all all signs indicate that um, that um, you know this is going to be really good for not only local economies and job creation. Um, it's going to be good for um, for buildings that sequester carbon, uh, are healthy buildings that <coughs> don't have a, as much VOCs in them, um, and. Uh, and it really addresses the externalities uh, that that uh, that we struggle with. Yeah, is the arrow or the okay. pointer? Okay, fantastic. So um, you know, again, this was the image of the uh, of the deforestation. Um, we started to look at um, uh, we use a, bio, a biomimicry process to to um, to think about uh, how champion species um, have way, found ways to adapt in. In climates, um, this um, happens to be the kapok tree. Um, I know we're running late, so I won't get into too much about it, but um, the uh, ability that it has to not only be an emergent and rise up above the canopy when it needs to, when it doesn't have to compete, it's low in spreading on the left, so it has this plasticity, and in in what they call intric canopy plasticity, and so it's adaptive and uh, storing water in its roots. Um, we uh, started to dive into well, what is our, this is what you, one of the ways you use biomimicry, you say, what's our functional challenges? How do we keep our concrete building uh, from overheating in the sun? Um, and um, so we looked at, uh, um, uh, actually kind of dove into the research about bark on trees is actually a, what's called a, um, uh, a low emissivity surface. So it, it rejects a lot of the heat spectrums and only allows the beneficial ones in. And as we were um, thinking about that, we said, so our challenge is to let air in and ventilate, because it's a naturally ventilated building, and reject heat. Uh, we came up with this idea of these horizontal bamboo rods um, that it would be perfect, it's low mass, horizontally placed in a high place with high sun angles, so you bounce a lot of radiant energy away. Um, turns out they, uh, there's stigma associated with uh, bamboo, um, poor person's material, uh, so now we have beautiful wooden rods. Uh, that'll last much, much longer, which is a good thing. 
Uh, and then, uh, so we had all this sort of these functional ideas and then um, in the day after Christmas in 2011, there was this amazing story on uh, national public radio um, that just happened to be on the air about the amazing resiliency of trees, um, specifically related to hurricanes. Um, and uh, they talked about, so I knew about Murray's Law, but I never really thought about it that deeply. And Murray's Law is, is uh, basic bifurcation uh, that you see everywhere. So your lungs keep bifurcating until you end up with uh, 300 million air sacs in your lungs. Um, you, you know, you'll see this in trees and your capillary systems. And um, so the amount of mass just keeps uh, sort of basically bifurcating. And so that was a point of inspiration for um, then using what little wood we had, which was bringing this idea of the second skin around the building that would reject heat and allow, allow air. And then using this, um, uh, this Murray's Law, which also scientists call mother-daughter branching, into this, um, this uh, structural system around the courtyard. Um, so we finally kind of had gone through um, a lot of functional needs, and then we were able to, through looking at nature, um, get to a point where we had uh, something that we think was more inspirational and beautiful. Um, uh, and then they, you know, midway they had to get another site, we had to move the building, we had to flip it so that it, uh, it worked um, because the building is, uh, captures the trade winds, which you'll see in the video. And now we're, um, you know, we're underway. Uh, and so we'll play a quick video, uh, four minutes. Project Haiti has been an incredible journey for the U.S. Green Building Council and our many partners who have come with us along the way. Six years ago when USGBC started this project, we got into it because we were trying to provide some relief for a country that had just been ravaged by an absolutely horrible earthquake that left tens of thousands of children without homes and without parents. Since then, the architecture has come together, the construction has come together, and importantly, we have been able to engage the local Haitian community, guided by our global partners, to build this beautiful center to fruition, so that this can become the home for many, many children who are waiting to have a home. We wanted to make a model that Haiti can be proud of, and that would serve as an example for the nation and also that it can be done in Haiti. What we're trying to do here is empower Foundation Enfant Jesus with a building that allows them to break the cycle of poverty in Haiti. It's going to be a landmark for the nation to be able to come and learn about what real child protection is about. And the goal was to be able to show that it can be done here can be done cost effectively. And you know, when history's written on this thing and people see the way this building actually works, and there's so little operating cost, and all of that money is able to go back into programming for these children, that's why we did LEAP. That's what LEAP means. Because we wanted to produce a low energy building, the challenge with a concrete building is it heats up in the sun. So we really started to think about how could we create a building that would really work in Haiti and keep it extremely simple. The building is arranged to capture the trade winds. Naturally ventilated, high louvers bring air through every room. The concept of the architecture is to be able to bring the outside in or the inside out, and so the, the doors on the first floor will open up. These large bifolding doors will create indoor-outdoor spaces, so the life of the building will really sort of spill out into this larger courtyard. Everything that's on this building, for the most part, is handmade from the railings to the doors, the artwork, it's all Haitian, handmade. And there's a, a true sense of pride that they're doing something that's gonna be here for a really long time. You know, we really wanted to work with local craftsmen, integrate arts, and respond to the strong culture that's already here. The idea is to create the ambience of the children playing together in harmony with nature, and also the integration of art in any building that they are doing in Haiti to give the sense of identity and beauty. This is a project that should be considered a model for Haiti. Doing better construction with local contractors and actually being able to transfer the knowledge and leave it in Haiti. One lead building is not gonna solve Haiti's climate vulnerability or serve every child in need. But what it is gonna do is provide a three-dimensional textbook for design in countries that are as vulnerable as Haiti is. It takes a village to raise a child. And literally, it has taken a village to establish this center. So I want to call out our significant partners and contributors 
thank you for taking this bold decision. Your vision is quickly coming to fruition. U.S. Green Building has been an amazing partner. I could never think Rick and Roger and Al and of course Thomas with his amazing design. And Mayash has always been part of this program and today he's in the lead and he hasn't stopped. The most important thing for me personally is that this is going to give an opportunity for every child to actually have the power to fight back. So what I'm hoping is that one of the child will eventually become the leader of the U.S. Green Building Council. And that's a dream I will share today and make sure that happens. Well, you know, the tech industry is, is one industry that we're seeing uh, a lot of uptake. And uh, Google um, was, was right out front with, um, with this. Um, they, they really do understand that uh, the pr their, their business depends, depends upon the performance of their employees. And, um, and, and now it seems like all the tech firms are really interested in, in this. Yeah. Yeah, and they build their own campuses. So, you know, your question is a good one about the smaller uh, projects. Um, so, you know, that's why FitWell is, is, is getting a lot of, age, you know, it's getting a lot of uptake um, that we're seeing is because it's easier. It's easier for smaller projects. And um, um, so, you know, you know, the, 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 you know de dealing with existing buildings is always hard, right? It's, it's, it's harder in many ways. So uh, it, not unlike what you're doing at UW right now, right? So that particular building, the hypothetical building that we were looking at was for a brand new building. And the whole philosophy and the owners and the people that's invested in that is, is really aiming for healthy and sustainable buildings. But I, I, can, I can agree with Tom in that you know, it is harder for, I think, small businesses, especially if you're only renting a portion of that building, because many of these things may be driven by how the the owner, the, the person that owns the whole entire building would you know, have to include stairwells. You can't have one section of the stairwell only. That would be daylit and would be active staircases and things like that. But what's kind of neat about Fitwell, and I think what we try to do in Bellevue is like with the, within the existing system or even within the existing floor, what are some strategies that you can actually pick to apply and, and it may not get you the certificate you may not have the threshold to be certified but at least you're making an effort to do that and it's a very um, pretty it's very user friendly you know you can it's all online and you can you know kind of pick and select the strategies that would at least at the minimum improve what you have right now right um, indoor indoor air quality that may kind of be dependent on your mechanical system. So there may be some things that you can't really change, but there may be other things that you can negotiate and see if you can change, like policies, things on the policies. Yeah, yeah just, I guess anyone on the panel, uh, what's, what's the consensus on operable windows in terms of, 
improving connection to nature as well as potential pollutants coming in the building that are not being controlled. I mean, I, I've seen it argued both ways, and I'm just curious what your opinions are. Uh, happy to do that. Um, you know, the, um, it, it's really place dependent, and um, I would actually think I would like to ask Duncan to answer this question because of the fact that he spent so much time in this particular subject. Um, and, and I don't know if you need to maybe move up here to be closer to the microphone. Well, but just um, worth mentioning that um, there is an office building in downtown Seattle that has operable windows with mixed mode ventilation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's really dependent on the sensors you have for the outdoor air quality. Um, but, but I do know that uh, in a mixed mode building, uh, it, lots of different ways for it to operate. This building operates by having a, a light that turns on when the air quality outside and the temperature is right. And the first time in the spring that happens, there's usually applause because everybody gets to open their windows. Mm -hmm. And the, the, just the human benefit of fresh air is really kind of emotionally stunning for folks. Um, so uh, I, I agree entirely though, there are places in Beijing I wouldn't recommend it. Um, <laughs> but, but that's only Beijing of today. And if they clean up their act um, and get to the place where the outdoor air is better, then it, it's, it's really worth considering. Yeah, just another interesting um, thing that we found. We were doing our indoor air quality study here at this building last summer during the wildfires that were very difficult for people, especially if they're sensitive. And we found that having a closed building was actually pretty important. Um, we could bring the air in through filters rather than <coughs> um, through you know, uncontrolled spaces. Um, Stanley, I don't know if you remember off the top of your head how much um, we captured. I think there was a 50% reduction in particulate matter yeah. going through the filters. Yeah, that's so for, I think that's for PM 2.5. Yeah. And the larger one, like PM 10, you filter most of it out. Because even though the outdoor, like, can see the time series data, even the outdoor fluctuates, the indoor stay pretty low for larger particles. But PM 2.5 basically, it follows whatever the outdoor is doing. It's just like half the amount. Yeah. The, the, the big, bigger issue here is that we, we did evolve largely in an environment where we're breathing outdoor air. And the, we, we, each of us have a kind of a microbiome. And so the, the, the bacteria and the other things in our environment aren't things that our bodies are used to, and we've been stripping that away over time. Um, and so there's, there's some indication that the recirculated um, uh, bacteria in buildings isn't necessarily good for us, or what's outdoors is actually has other benefits. So it's, it's hard to reduce it to a single measure. But I know if I go to a hotel, I want to be able to open a window. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's how I decide on where I'm staying. I mean, it's, it makes a huge difference. Any other burning questions? I think we're we at time here. But I, I, this isn't necessarily a question, just sort of a comment. I, I'm a little dismayed, frankly, that we've started off with a conversation that talked about the inequities in health outcomes depending upon your wealth and all these other factors and, and all this discussion about uh, healthy buildings and what you have to do to achieve them. The monitoring, the certification, these things that all cost money and that you know lower lower income populations just aren't going to spend and aren't going to have. Right. So and, so and go ahead. Well, so I, uh, this is a personal fact I'll reveal. So Tom and I have been married for some 20 years, and you can imagine the dialogues we have in our <laughs> <laughs> um, But one of, the, one of the tensions is, and I bring up this issue all the time, I mean, healthy buildings are, are great, um, and they're great for all the reasons that have been expertly described. Um, the, my point is always, and who gets access to those buildings? Who gets access to <coughs> the latest, best technologies? And we can look at other sectors, not healthy buildings, but wherever you see, for example, advances in health care, whether it be new treatment, new information, um, better off people benefit first and most. And it takes a long time, if ever, the, that those advances trickle to those um, without. So it's it's a good point, and I'm glad that you made it. Um, and one that Tom and I talk about almost every day. 
Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, that's why I was hoping to end on that, the, the slides or the, the video of Katie. Um, because what happened over that period of time on that project was, you know, this building is just super, super simple. Um, and it's naturally ventilated. Um, it does have a PV array on the roof and has a, a water filtration system uh, and a well. Uh, it has a, um, it tre treats all its own waste on the site with, uh, with a vertical flow wetland. And, um, you know, it's, it's pretty simple. And I'd like to think that why aren't we just doing that everywhere? Why, why aren't we doing that in, 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 you know, for everyone? And um, I, I think that, I hope that we'll, we'll get there, we'll figure out a way to get there. But this, this idea of trickling down technology uh, is a hard, because it takes so long, um, that I think that we have to just get really creative about finding ways to, um, to think about this in our Who's, who, who it is. And, um, just comment on that. The one good thing that I'm seeing, so when Lee first came out, how many years ago it was, all the manufacturers were like, oh my gosh, this is never gonna work, blah, 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 blah. Well, okay, so it's taking time. But now it's, it's almost uncommon to find like a paint that has high VOCs in it, just in general. Yeah, there's specialty stuff that is sometimes they like to, you know, if you find metallic paint, it's gonna be nasty. But more and more of the building materials and the manufacturers are stepping up their game, and they're taking out the phthalates, and they're taking out the redless materials, and they're taking out the, so there's less of the new building smell than there was 10, 15 years <laughs> ago. And so I, I think the point is that it's, it's not going to happen today, it's not going to happen tomorrow, it may not even happen this decade, but as long as we keep pushing for this and keep and keep uh, talking about the benefits to the health and the benefits to everybody's profit line in every building, right, because if you've got healthy employees that show up that are happier, they're going to take better care of your clients and customers, whether it's Jack in the Box or a CEO, it doesn't matter, but eventually, all of the manufacturers are going to figure this out, and they're starting to do so. And as they do that, then the costs come down, and it, and it it's slow, but it is becoming more open to everybody. So that's a trickle down that I think, yeah, yeah, um, yeah One it's thing is an example it's slow, of it. Yeah. It, it, I've, I've watched it. I've watched materials improve over the last 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> But one thing I just want to bring to everybody's attention, and Jennifer Ewing and I have had this conversation, and you know, we would like to build a coalition soon. I keep thinking how much I want to pack the three of you up and take you to Olympia. And I had a sense of frustration at the same time because the research that you're all doing at a state-funded university needs to make its way to Olympia because the way the affordable housing funding is being distributed, it's based on pro forma by unit. And so the state of Washington, even though it has the Evergreen Sustainable Development Standard, it, they are not really funding a higher level of healthy buildings because they have this you know, benchmark pro forma that's down here and the healthy building is up here. And so, and in particular, the project that's going to be built in your city, Mora, in Tukwila, the Riverton Park project, has really raised our awareness around this problem because we have a really, we have a great project that's going to be using the Built Green Emerald Star certification. They're also doing Living Building Challenge Petal. I mean, it's just a really cool pilot project. But the state saying, you know, we don't care if you do that. So just as long as you meet this minimum benchmark, you know, that's what we want to fund. All these other bells and whistles, we're not really interested in funding that because it changes your pro forma. So, you know, um, we, we haven't quite figured out how we're going to do this. I know there's a project here in Bellevue, I think, as well. Is that what was driving some of that for you, Jennifer? <laughs> I was just kind of interested in just because I think it, green building in general is an affordability strategy, but we're sort of limited in how that can actually get funded. Um, 
<clears throat> to go kind of above and beyond oh, yeah. the green standard. And it's especially been challenging for King County because we have a lead plaque and benchmark. And so anything, in, you know, in our legislation, anything that we fund needs to meet that benchmark. But then the state who gives us the affordable housing money doesn't want to help us meet that benchmark, right? So it's definitely been kind of a challenge between, um, you know, how far can we go without the state smacking your hand going, you can't go any further because now you're changing the pro forma on your unit cost. So it would be very interesting to take all this research, compile it, and hand that off to commerce and say, you know, you're, you're kind of missing the point here on what the possibilities are for, especially communities that are already compromised by proximity to industrial waste or, you know, Chronic stress. Chronic stress, exactly. Full array of daily stressors. This Young 2030 district is a really good resource if you're not connected with them. We're we're Yeah, yeah. because they've been working with Seattle City Light to change the performance around how um, tenant based buildings can pay for better performance uh, at a first cost basis. Yeah. So that, that would be a great thing to bring to them. It would be a good, thank you, that's a good reminder. And it's a challenge, I think, for a lot of cities in, in King County because they're not in city light territory. Mm -hmm. So the benefits that city light are putting together. Bonneville Power is now kind of on board with similar or even better uh, incentive programs, but then PSE, who takes up a whole lot of space in other parts outside of the city of Seattle, hasn't really caught on quite yet to funding the incentives in that same fashion. So. But just having that one model really helps move the dial. And now that BPA, Bonneville Power is on board too, um, it's gonna help a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know that we're gonna get sent. I, I think that's okay. It's, uh, it's on YouTube, it's on the USGBC's <laughs> website. Um, yeah, USGBC's website, you know, just looking yeah. at Project 80. Thanks for your patience with that. Um, and um, apologies. That's okay. Great you know, uh, we're looking forward to it, Tom. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, we, this has all happened to us Maybe before, uh, so yeah. we know <laughs> we go in thinking it's not going to work, and I if it works, then it's good. Working in the beginning. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming, and let's thank Eric.